the webinar is now open. So welcome everyone. We are still waiting for people to join us. So we won't start the webinar until it's one o'clock uh, Swedish time or Central European time. So, but welcome. Um, if you hear me speaking, that means that your audio is working, which is a good thing. But I don't know if I can continue speaking about nothing for three minutes, so I uh, should do some, something else. We usually have music uh, to go with the webinar so that you can check your, your audio. So let's see if I can pick something nice to play for you. Um, Hi, Susanna. Hi, Gareth. Hello. <laughs> Crikey, what a day. <laughs> we are we are live. So. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Not a problem at all. Thank you. Good to have you here. And Thank it is very much. now, now uh, one o'clock exactly uh, our time. So I think we will just uh, let people, well, let Gareth uh, catch his breath and also <laughs> make sure that we get everyone in that has, uh, I see that people are still still coming in. So let's just uh, wait for at least a minute or two to make this happen. And I will make a short introduction before you're on, Gareth. Okay, thank you. You can still, you can still breathe. <laughs> I can still breathe just about. It's been a full on morning, I can tell you. So it's, it's uh, hang on, I'll just put a do not disturb on my phone because I'm having to connect to my phone because my Wi-Fi has stopped working. There we go. Yeah, I can still see that people are coming in, but let's uh, try to be efficient and timely and start this on time. So um, welcome everyone to this uh, Friday webinar that we have um, usually, sorry, I need to do this. Um, Sorry, now I'm ready to go. So welcome everyone. I'm really happy to see that so many people have uh, joined us today for this uh, webinar. Uh, as you can probably see, we have international sign language interpre interpretation and we also have live captioning, uh, which is included in the Zoom um, 
closed captioning functionality. And we will also provide you with a specific link for those of you who would prefer to have the captioning uh, on the side. And we also have a Swedish automatic translation of the captions for those of you who, who would like that for all our Swedish and Norwegian and Danish uh, listeners. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, for those of you who would like the, um, the uh, uh, translation, then there is a drop down menu that you, where you need to choose to have the Swedish uh, translation. So, uh, but Eva can help you in the, if you ask questions in the chat, any technical questions can be covered uh, by my colleague Eva. So today uh, we are going to have a, uh, a little longer program than we usually have on the Friday webinars because we have exciting uh, speakers. So we will start off with a presentation from Gareth Ford Williams, whom I almost woke up this morning to make sure that he could he join did us. did wake up. That was because I know he's one of the few people who I can wake up in the middle of the night and ask them <laughs> for a presentation with absolutely yeah. no, no warning or, or preparation, and he will do it job. So the reason Thank I needed to, to wake him up was because our original sp speaker, Jamie, with his lion, and uh, he is uh, uh, not well, he's actually in hospital. So he said, sent his greetings to all of you, but the doctor said he could mm -hmm. not make an event from his uh, hospital bed, which was what he wanted to do. So um, let's hope that he will um, get better very soon. And in the meantime, we can listen to Gareth, which I know will be very, very good. So Gareth is also from the BBC. And, and then after that short presentation, having me, uh, being the uh, end user perspective of this, which is of course what we always want to start with, from we start always from the end user, uh, then we will have the, uh, the presentation of the project with uh, one of my dearest colleagues, Sarah, uh, who will present the, the national research project that we have been now doing for over, I think, three years. Um, uh, on criteria for cognitive accessibility, which I hope is what you're all here for. And then we will turn uh, to a panel with very distinguished uh, panelists. Um, uh, we have Shadi Abuzara from the w W3C, and Gareth will join us also for the, uh, for the panel, which will, and also Sarah, of course. And then we have another dear friend of mine, Christian Bühler from the Technical University of Dortmund who is a specialist in cognitive accessibility and we have been working in many uh, interesting uh, research projects uh, uh, recently. And then we have another uh, uh, jump in, <laughs> uh, Bart de Klerk from the Federal Belgian uh, Agency for Monitoring of, of Web Accessibility, which has a long name I can't remember, but really that is uh, what they're doing. And he also, I didn't wake him up actually, but, but I also asked him very early this morning because Peter Kimeny, who is an ex um, a DigiConnect European Commission uh, staff member, he uh, also was uh, prohibited from, from uh, joining us today, unfortunately. But we have still, we did get the end user perspective in place and we did get the policy perspective. So we still have the same setup and I know that these new speakers will do a brilliant job. After the panel, uh, we will have room for uh, Q&A. So if you do have a question during the presentations, please write them in the Q&A function and we will make sure to, to try to answer them um, as, as, as many of them as we can uh, in the open Q&A session. And then we will try to wrap up and, and stop the session at three o'clock um, Central Europe time. And I did see the comments on us not being clear on the, on the time zone. Um, we have got that from several and I'm really sorry about that. And we will just try to make it better uh, next time but you are here so some somewhere or another you you knew what time it was supposed to be okay so um if you uh, i don't know if you managed to make slides gareth or if you just want to speak freely that's uh, entirely up to you of course but you're you are welcome to share share your screen if you would like to or otherwise i will just give the floor i've to... got some slides i've, I've okay. got some slides um and uh, yes it's i think i can use the slideshow hopefully you should be able to it's you all are gone dark. Uh, can you see that so i put use the slides up can you see the slides i don't see them yet so uh, do we... uh, try one more time uh, gareth 
I made you co-host just to be on the safe side. Okay. It will have one work before still, but. I am now trying to work out how to get out of this. I think I shared the slides before you made me co-host and now none of the controls are popping up. Yeah, this is the new life we are all living <laughs> with technology helping us and sometimes not helping us so much. Yes. <laughs> I seem to be in screen mode. I'm just going to take out full screen mode. Anyway, I'll talk a little bit about myself and start going. Um, so my name is Gareth Ford Williams. Uh, I'm uh, head of uh, UX design at the BBC. Um, and I'm trying to share screen at the minute. You cannot modify uh, the advanced sharing options, so I can't share my screen at the minute. Um, just don't think. Uh, there we go. Let's yeah. try that. Yes. Now we managed to... Yes. Fantastic. Good. So if I make that full screen, is that working? It's fantastic. Beautiful. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> so yes. So my name is Gareth Williams. I'm a head of UX, one of the UX design at BBC. Um, um, I have ADHD, I'm dyslexic, uh, according to Jamie, I'm probably autistic as well. Um, Jamie uh, uh, did a wonderful job of actually um, making that point in a BBC training video that I didn't know about until it was played at an event where I was at stage. It's like, thanks, Jay. But that's, that's it. He was like, well, you probably are. <laughs> so, but I have traits. Um, we share a lot of traits, Jamie and I. Jamie is also, he's a He's autistic, he has ADHD, um, but as, as Jamie always says, you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. You know, we're all very, very different and we all have, uh, it, and, uh, and autism, ADHD, and dyslexia are all generally kind of, uh, 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 they're all different in different people in different ways. I mean, there, there are obviously, you know, hard medical things behind them. Uh, you know, it's uh, dyslexia is a, a, a condition that affects the audio center of the brain. Um, you know, ADHD is about my frontal lobes and basal ganglia, etc. So we know we know what causes them, but uh, the way it manifests is always slightly different. Gareth, um, Gareth you're, you're speaking extremely fast. Please remember. I am going. To, yes. I am going to slow down. Thank you very much. Another trait of the, the <laughs> of Gareth. So uh, I will move on to the next slide. Um, so as I said, I'm dyslexic. And uh, I'm an ADHD. -er. Um, I struggle with the title ADHD. Uh, it, it's this, there's no person centered language around ADHD, and I'm going to focus mostly on HD, ADHD in this talk. Um, I like to use the word Tigger um, because you can be dyslexic, you can be autistic, you can be dyspraxic. Yeah, um, you know, the, the, everyone has a has a has a, a, a name, a you know, that they can own. But for ADHD, for some reason, it's missing. Um, also, yeah, ap apologies, uh, the, the, this was version 0.3.1 um, last time I gave it, uh, and from this morning I've spent a whole 15 minutes re reorganizing it um, for, for hopefully a shorter version, and, uh, and so, uh, and it comes with a lot of warnings, this is, uh, this is sort of structured, the slides are probably more used to me than they are of you, they enable me to keep on track, um, and uh, remind me of what I'm supposed to be talking about. Uh, I have an appalling short term memory, uh, so I might forget what point I plan to make or what point I am trying to make. Um, I also go off on tangents and get a little lost, so hopefully these pull me. Um, lost words also lead to anxiety, which leads to more lost words, so sometimes I forget words. So a pause usually is I'm trying to remember the word I can remember the abstract concept for. So as I said, ADHD, there are very much brain differences. It's a developmental disorder. Um, and uh, and similar to dyslexia. How many people have ADHD? We're not entirely sure. Uh, as with autism and dyslexia, um, you know, the, uh, the way that we uh, screen for it is all designed around manifests in boys. So lots and lots of girls slip through the net. Uh, we don't know because since before 1989, there was no screening in schools in the UK or the US. I'm not quite sure what it's like for the rest of Europe, but I'm pretty sure it isn't, is, is not, it's going to be a fairly similar picture. Um, so we really don't know. 5% children, girls, 
by the way, it's a lifelong condition. Anyone who says that they used to have ADHD did not have ADHD. Um, you don't suddenly, your brain does not suddenly change overnight. Usually people are talking about that because they've learned really good masking. And so they've got past some of the problems and they present in a different way, but masking is not cure. So 3% of adults masking, 30% of the UK's population, of uh, prison population, um, they have actually uh, uh, done screening in two uh, of the UK's prisons, uh, which is quite an interesting statistic. Another lovely statistic of a 40% more chance of dying before 40 if you have ADHD. Um, we looked into this and I talked to the uh, NHS about it and I thought, is this to do with the anxiety and depression? goes with it and there's a lot of people who go into substance abuse and they said no it's mostly things like falling out of trees um so uh to talk about adhd itself uh, hyperactivity um compulsion get distracted very easily can be quite reactive don't have much of a filter what usually comes out it's why there's so many stand-up um, that have adhd um, one called Rory Bremner, who's a very well-known one in the UK, I got to speak to him quite recently, and he said if it wasn't for his ADHD, it wouldn't be funny, because half the time he hears the joke at the same time the audience does. Uh, Short-term memory losses, obviously it's not everyone, but these are quite common things. Uh, uh, little choice of focus. I can really focus, I just can't necessarily choose what it is that I'm focusing on. I uh, miss social cues a lot, um, can become hyper-focused. Um, uh not very good with structure um can get very very obsessive about things uh, can get very very emotional uh and as i already said short term memory loss um as uh, cognition is a is is a you know an, an interesting disorder all all cognitive disorders they you find that people share traits across all sorts of different types of conditions um and uh you know you find that most people you know if you if you weighted to one you get a you get a uh, um, uh, you get a diagnosis, um, but you generally find people have little bits of all sorts of others. Um, little disclaimer, uh, next bit is mostly anecdotal and there's very little science behind any of the following whatsoever. I mean, there's a little bit about me um, really that comes out uh, beyond this and it's me, 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 me. Um, having ADHD is a personal experience. Um, someone described it to me and I love this description is having a load of TV switched on in your head all of them are on different channels. All of them are on full volume. Um, you have no idea which one you're supposed to be looking at. Someone else has control of the remote control and keeps changing them randomly. Um, it really does feel like that a lot of the days. Um, I spend a lot of time doing things like trying to deal with short term memory by writing things on myself. I spend a lot of time writing because I can't lose myself. I'll lose the paper. So I am generally covered in, in all sorts of notes. And the problem is I forget when I write reverse engineer dark patterns on my arm, what on earth I was thinking of at the time. Um, you carry a lot with you uh, if you have a cognitive condition, depending on your upbringing. Um, I, I always find that was, that's I, it's one of my favorite pictures of me sitting at the, the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency table at CSUN. I was invited to sit there um, and I said, it's gonna be funny for me. Uh, because when I was a kid in the early 1970s, I'm 52, uh, I was made to sit on a table that was called the thick table, which was for all children who couldn't, who struggled with reading or maths or, or concentration or anything. Uh, and literally, the teachers called it the thick table. Everyone called it the thick table. And that stuff stays with you for life. And you believe that that's where you should be sat. Um, I learned coping strategies from a very young age because we had a wonderful school teacher who believed that we all should learn show tunes as children, and that was an important part of school. And the King and I um, uh, actually taught me my first coping, coping strategy aged about five or six. Um, and because I was a hugely anxious child, but incredibly hyperactive child, um, there were some wonderful lyrics that whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect. I whistle happy tunes so no one will suspect I'm afraid. And the end bit is the result of this deception is very strange to tell, but when I fool the people I fear, I fool myself as well. I was taught masking by the King and I. I don't know anyone else who's taught masking by the King and I, but I'm very good at it. And you cover it and everyone thinks you've got no problem and you move on. I was also taught focus by one of my um, uh, 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 babysitters, my who used to look after me. Um, he was actually the Chinese community leader in Manchester at the time, a chap called Lorette Lee, wonderful fella. Um, and he used to bring bowls and buttons 
and uh, and chopsticks and uh, and a chocolate bar. And they said, sit there and move all those buttons from that bowl to that bowl. At the end, you can have the chocolate bar, but you've got to do it using the chopsticks. And I learned to use chopsticks. And I also learned to concentrate because <laughs> I wanted that chocolate. Incredibly useful. I think he just did it just for a quiet life. Um, and my mum also had this. She was an embroiderer in the 70s. And all of these threads that are on here were unpicked by me from industrial mop heads because we didn't have a great deal of money. That's where she bought her threads from, was from waste materials from factories. And I literally handpicked them all and arranged them all. Taught me a huge amount. Um, as I said, no structure thing in life. Um, I've been a sound engineer. I've, I've done a fine art degree. I've been a life model, a machine operator, cleaner, seller manager, letting agent, artist studio manager, business development manager, art director, brand manager, TV radio producer, accessibility specialist and our head of UX design. There's absolutely no plan in there whatsoever. It just the next thing happens. And and it's like that on a, every day. Um, you know, you, you deal a lot with anxiety, you deal a lot with all sorts of other challenges around and uh, and, and it become really difficult. And uh, and I, I find that when I talk to a lot of other people who have similar conditions, um, the anxiety is uh, a, probably one of the biggest barriers is uh, for dealing um you know with things on a daily basis um and imposter syndrome sets up i actually found a better meme than this one of no idea what i was doing someone actually put up one the other day that just said you're not important enough to have imposter syndrome um and i thought that is absolutely brilliant uh, i have a lot of fidget toys uh, this is one that i've got with me at the moment which is a pebble i found on a beach that looks like a barbara hepworth sculpture uh, love it. Uh, I've had it for years and it's silent. It makes no noise, which is really good for meetings and presentations. And I have other ones that are very, very nice, uh, um, noisy, like this wonderful, wonderful cube uh, that was given to me by uh, a friend of mine in the Apple accessibility team when we were over in the States last. Um, it's, uh, it's fantastic, but my word, it, it's very unpopular in meetings, so I don't bring it. I rarely finish anything. Um, I'm a very good person at starting things and I'm a very good person at finding problems. Um, as one person on my team who's autistic recently pointed out that I'm incredibly good at asking questions um, and he's very good at answering them. <laughs> and uh, we work very well together in that way. Um, but he said he would have nothing to answer if I didn't go around finding where all the questions are. So we work very, very well together. Uh, and my brain is obviously, you know, it's utterly obsessed or uninterested. Um, and I have to, it's, it's nothing that I have necessarily control over. It's just lucky that accessibility is, a, is an obsession of mine uh, and it's my day job. Um, compulsion I've already talked about and this is with me, you know, I really am, you know, if something says don't do it, my brain's like already there going, go on, do it. And um, I find it very, very difficult to, to not do things. I think this is kind of partly, it was an interesting thing about the prison uh, statistics uh, that when you actually look in half of the things that you know most of the reasons those people are in there are very very impulsive uh, crimes you know how fast does this car go um, how much can I drink and <laughs> it's like and they get into all sorts of trouble um, and uh, you know we're not we're not the best at planning also I have a tendency of getting hugely distracted I literally did once I uh, was late for a, a date with my now wife because I spent an hour staring at a wall. Um, and when I don't want to do things, I will do them, but they generally go wrong as this wonderful um, sculpture that was in our, our, it's in our local art gallery. Um, there's a chap who goes around art galleries, uh, blindfold, putting up shelves. Um, actually did a better job than I can do because that's not something that interests me at all. I'll have a go. I don't do it necessarily on purpose, but the lack of focus does struggle or I'll subvert um, and, uh, and I find ways of round of going, well, that kind of works well enough for me. Um, it's not necessarily where the rules are. But when I do get focused, like these paintings that I like doing, um, which I, I can do a whole hour talking about them, um, I do will sit there and make hundreds of painted dots, um, if not thousands of painted dots um, on screen. So there's, a, there's an interesting evolutionary um, theory about ADHD. Um, Jonathan Williams, who's a clinical uh, psychologist, came up with, um, which is all to do with actually its evolutionary advantage. Uh, it's not a disease. I'm not broken. I'm actually here for a purpose. And I really quite like this. And so this picture is a lot of nomadic um, 
uh, people from the sort of ice age probably um, all sitting around at the fire and I, I've always thought they're asking where's Gareth um, Gareth is over there um, Gareth went to find out being eaten by lions um, he went to ask whether lion he, they were asking whether lions were friendly because they've never seen them before Gareth found out um, and uh, they now know lions not friendly um, it, it's it's uh, you know this is that whole thing it's it's you know the, the, you come across the berries in a bush and you don't know if they're poisonous i've probably already eaten some as a kid you know it's like it's uh, this is this is why we get into so much trouble it's uh, you know you're you're questioning it i've already doing it um so you know as i've already pointed out you know we're, we're very much divert i find divergent thinking is is very much my skill um, and uh, I find working with people who are very good at convergent thinking, we work out. So I like finding barriers. I like understanding the questions and, and unpicking and, and pulling apart because then that actually when we come to do answers, um, we have more data and more information that will lead to better answers. So cognitive design um, is about, uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to get into this a little bit, is about uh, usability uh, from a neuroscientific perspective and cognitive accessibility is about barriers faced by people who are neurodivergent. They're two very different things. And there's a Venn diagram uh, with dragons somewhere in the middle. But this is the area that I think is, I find most interesting. A few tips, hints and tips and bits and pieces uh, as well to think about. Um, I, I find I get over, stimulus wise because of my ADHD um, there's a general tip with ADHD children is do not paint their bedrooms red um, or any other bright and heavy color I had a bright orange bedroom with black and white striped everything this was the 1970s I hardly slept it was just screaming at me and it was no wonder I was going bouncing off the walls it's um uh, you know, it, 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 it's so, uh, and we've got one of our, our main buildings in the BBC, our, our news building, which I sometimes have to work in, um, obviously not at the moment with lockdown, but, uh, you know, the, the news branding is red, so everything is red, <laughs> and I just sit there, I can't concentrate, I find the place awful. Um, signifiers and affordances are incredibly, uh, you know, important for me. You know they, they've got to they've got to connect you know stop is green and go is red i'll get massively confused because my associations pull around the other way you know you have to kind of stick with what for, for someone like myself you have to really really stick with what is a convention um for me to be able to understand it and i learn those conventions and deal with them within a design sense so you know you have a box with a name and by the way don't get me started on inline forms i can't stand them because i've got no idea where i'm supposed to be filling anything in boxes is where you put um uh you put information but if it says name i mean literally my brain i need to like whose name what name the name of what and i start unpicking it you know i i, I need the very very specific instructions because i am likely because i've gone through all of the probabilities is to pick the wrong one and talk myself out of it I also, you know, flashing objects, massively problematic is the animations. Uh, one of the things that the BBC we've done uh, is, uh, you know, I can't, I'm actually not looking at the screen right now because I can't stop looking at that dot on the right, it really annoys me. Um, one of the things that the BBC we've done to help uh, ADHD children is on all our children's services, you know, lots of the websites and apps, they have moving backgrounds. We, we allow the child to uh, freeze backgrounds and freeze animations and opt out of the motion um, and reduce the motion. We, we did a similar thing at UView as well, is removing semi-opaque backgrounds from menus and all the other things, because it makes reading text and it makes focusing virtually impossible. Um, but giving control to the user is so important. Um, another little thing around uh, talk about is no, uh, noise and targets. And so if you, uh, when I was an art student, I, I, I got very much into uh, Kazmir Malevich, um, Russian avant-garde artist, uh, art theorist, early 20th century, um, probably responsible for the first ever, uh, you know, abstract painting, but huge influence on non-objective minimalist art. But he, he'd use basically say, if you want someone to look at a dot, um, put a dot down. Um, but because as soon as you put two dots down, you, you've halved their attention. Three dots, it, it's now, you know, a, a, only a third is important, it's a quarter of important. And, and it just becomes harder and harder to remember 
what it is that you're supposed to be looking at. And this works in design and the amount of interfaces that I see that, you know, remind me of the old Yahoo homepage where it was just so full of dots, you've got no idea what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And that was always the lovely thing about Google. <laughs> it's like, is there's a button and a place I put a word in and it gives me an answer, such a, such a simple thing. Uh, Robert Humans from YouTube um, gave a fantastic um, uh, UX Live presentation called The Key Principles of Cognitive Design. And the talk introduced me to a uh, perceptual psychologist, uh, Dr. Anne Treisman, who studied human perception. And she discovered, or at least, you know, she, she identified the pop out effect. Um, uh, any search task is made easier if there's something unique about the target, something that will pop out of the display. The more unique the target is, the more it pops out. And so, you know, where is the green square? And it's really, really, you know, it's, it's obvious here. There are squares, there are circles, but there's only one green square. Um, it takes a, a, a moment because of the visual clutter, because of the, the greenness of the square. But when you ask where the green square is, you know, within that, then it, you know, and it's all just green, it becomes much more hidden. It's much harder to spot. And where you ask the green square again, where it is with this one, um, where it's just red circles uh, within it, and there's only one green square, it's incredibly obvious. And so, you know, looking at these kind of things, it's, it's, and this is a really, really very, very, very basic, is if you've got a thing that you really need people to focus on and think about helping them focus, so it was a mode that we built in on UView when we built, uh, I helped, I was part of the product and design team that, that built the TV platform in the UK. Is there is a mode you can put on, so only the things that are in focus and related to the things that are in focus are the thing down. And so you move to another thing and then different things fall backwards to the background and stand out. And for someone like me who needs that kind of relationship and that, that pull between the two of them, that mode really helped me understanding complex menus what i was supposed to and where i can go so guys, so uh, to wrap up now because we're i am on to... my second to last slide that's good and yeah. and so that was all i've got to say is that really <laughs> i've cut it right down from the original one obviously for, for brevity um but uh, a place that if you are interested in in cognitive accessibility in the work that's ha happening um, I would, you know, obviously, uh, Jamie and I have, have been along as guests um, to the Cognitive Accessibility Working Group, W3C. Um, there's some fabulous work coming out of that group, um, and they're drawing in from the whole of the industry to try and formalise some of the, some of the uh, ideas and findings and data that's there into, into uh, really good guidance. Um, and uh, I'm leaving the BBC fairly soon, and uh, if... Um, if you do want to follow me, I'm at Gareth FW on Twitter and pretty much everywhere else. I'm Gareth FW as well. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth. Perfect. Very good timing. <laughs> so brilliant presentation <laughs> as always. And, and really, thanks a lot for... for uh, it wasn't by design. Up. Pure chance <laughs> that that ended up on time. <laughs> okay. I think this... Um, this um, if you stop sharing, then we can let Sarah go in with the with the slides. Oh, so I'm hoping, yeah. So uh, I think this is a, a very was a very good um, way to sort of start starting point to make sure that we all understand why this is so important and really what uh, what cognitive accessibility is is all about, at least from one perspective. Because of course there are many other aspects of what cognition is as Gareth also said. So um, in the project that Sarah is going to, uh, to show us the results of now, we have had a very broad perspective of cognition and of course the neurodiversity is, is, is one path, but really I believe that this is um, important to, to all of us uh, and, and in many different situations and, and contexts. So now I want to leave the floor to Sarah who is leading uh, our project on cognitive criteria. Please, Sarah. It's always good to remember to unmute yourself. Uh, I was so already out of breath after Garrett's brilliant presentation that um, I'll try to just calm down and speak a bit slowly because I'm also normally a very fast, um, fast mover. Now it says that a co-host asked you to start your video. Thank you for that prompt as well. 
So I will try to do that. Good. Yes. Now we see you. Perfect. Always nice with these technological prompts as well. Um, great. So your your presentation is in Keynote. So if you make it presentation mode, then it shows. Better. Oh, I see presentation mode. So that's very strange. Um, how how is that? Let's see. If you just push the yeah exactly yeah yeah and so now it's perfect. Strange it was presentation mode from from my side. Anyway, so here we go. Just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today. First, I would like to just follow up on uh, Gerrit's presentation about what it actually means. What is cognitive accessibility? And specifically, specifically when we talk about web. Um, and then, of course, go into the research project to develop criteria for cognitive accessibility. And also, at the end, a few takeaways from this, um, from this project. So just what is cognition about on the web? And we could do probably a couple of hours just talking about this, but just extremely briefly. Cognition is about how we take in and gather information from the environment. Um, so it's not only information. When we say information, we think maybe things we read or now that you're listening to me. But it's also all sorts of information. I mean, if you're sitting or standing, your um, senses is telling you whether you are comfortable. Maybe it's too cold, maybe it's too hot. Maybe you have background noises somewhere. And all these things is constantly si signaling to your brain that there is some information that you need to deal with, to understand, and also make a decision about if you need to do anything, and in that case, what. So if you have many sources of information and a lot of information coming in at the same time, there is a huge risk of cognitive overload. And the threshold for this is different for different people. I mean, if you have a cognitive disability, then usually your senses are heightened. So you will see the red more redder, or you will um, have the feeling that people are screaming at you, even though it may be low uh, voices for somebody else. But it's also important to remember that cognitive overload can happen to anyone um, in stressful situations, and if there is a lot of information going on. Like for some people now, perhaps you are distracted by the um, sign interpretation. Um, I certainly do my most not to look at that specific part of the screen where it's moving because I know it will distract me. So this is kind of an interesting question when you talk about accessibility, because what is accessible and a help for some persons may also be a distraction uh, for others. But in terms of websites and, and digital interfaces, what generally helps for most people is to have a clear structure where you can find the information easily and where there are few distractions. So all these flashing things, things that are moving, a lot of different elements in different parts of the websites, all of these sort of adds to a cognitive overload. But actually there is one sort of exception to this where additional information can be helpful. And that is when you have a text and an image or uh, let's say audio and text that says the same thing. So with multimodality, if you have several sources providing the same information, then it helps to get the message through to the brain and it helps the understanding. Also, what is usually good for um, cognitively accessible websites is that you have some sort of help and support. So if you get stuck, you know what to do. Um, certainly, it's common for a lot of people to feel a bit insecure on, on the web. What happens if I press this button? Will the computer explode or will I get kicked off or out of the platform? Or did I just buy something for 2 million euros? So if you have... Um, context relevant help and the clarity and structure. This is really helpful for most people, I would say. 
The thing is though, um, even though there are loads of recommendations on cognitive accessibility, few of these needs are actually covered in current legislation. And I'll let you think about this in sort of a cliffhanger. I mean, we, we have a theory about why this is the case, and we built the whole project around this theory. But just for, for a second, take a, a minute to, to reflect on why it's the case that even though so many people need cognitive accessibility, it's still not very well covered in the current standards and legislation. So of course, when we see a gap or a problem, we see an opportunity, the opportunity to do a new project. Um, and so we saw this challenge to sort of do a project for more criteria on cognitive accessibility that can promote cognition into legislation and standards. So the challenge that we were looking at is specifically, how can criteria for cognitive accessibility be included in standards and legislation? So when you have a project, you need some um, ways to, to measure it. So how, how actually are we going about to, um, to do this? Um, what's the success criteria for, for us? And we believe, and this is our theory about why it's not sufficiently covered in legislation, and that, that is that the key to success is to have the measurable criteria. There are lots of recommendations um, in cognition, but one of the main criticisms against the recommendations has been that they are too broad. For example, it's good to have texts that are not too complicated. Well, okay, but what is complicated text. I mean, does it depend on how many words you have, how complicated words there are, how long they are? It depends on the context. Is it academic? Uh, who is the audience? So it's pretty difficult to say, is this text complicated? Yes or no. Um, and if you have standards and criteria uh, that is for legis legislation, then there is somebody that needs to make sure that uh, the rules, the law is actually upheld. And you need to be able to say, yes, this is correctly implemented or no, the criteria has not been met. So you need a more binary kind of um, way of looking at it. And if you have, for example, in WCAG, um, there is a criteria that there needs to be uh, alternative texts for um, pictures. So it's very easy to say, yes, there is an alternative text or no. But the interesting part with this is that there is actually an element of judgment in it, because then you have to see, is the alternative text actually relevant? Um, and that is not always the case. So what I would like to say with this is really that, yes, it's possible, we think, to do measurable criteria for cognition, but it's also not completely true that all the criteria for traditional web accessibility is completely binary. So we were lucky enough to find some funding for our idea. idea. Um, and uh, we have a project financed by Vinova, which is the Swedish innovation agency. And the specific aim of the project is then to convert recommendations that exist. So not to invent anything new, but really take recommendations on cognitive accessibility and transform them into measurable criteria. Um, and in these kinds of projects, there are people that are smarter than us saying that, well, you can't actually change the world at, at first. I mean, you need to start small. You need to start with a specific sector. Um, and it's, even though we like to think big, it's better to just try it in, the, in a smaller setting. And we did the pilot in the education sector. And the reason why we chose education is um, firstly, because education is so hugely important for inclusion in society. Pupils that fall back in, in education have really, really difficulties to get included in, in later life. And also, um, because at least in, in Sweden, there's been a push towards digitalization in the education sector. And this was even before the pandemic, um, actually. 
So what we have seen is that more and more teaching material, so textbooks, but also um, exams, so the national standardized exams are now going to be digital. And what happens if you're a pupil and you have a very specific um, cognitive impairment and you need to understand both what you're supposed to respond to the actual question that you're responding to and also understand the, the digital environment that may not be accessible. Um, then you have higher chances of, of failure in, in the particular exam, and not because you don't know the things you're supposed to know, but because um, inaccessibility of the digital interface. So we also had another um, idea in the beginning. We thought that we could not really solve this whole issue sitting uh, in an isolated chamber thinking big thinking. I mean, big thoughts, it doesn't really work. You have to talk to people and you have to make sure that the persons um, both that are developing and designing and um, uh, procuring digital interfaces and accept and can use the criteria and also of course that they make sense that they actually um, make a difference for the users so in the project we have a core partnership of funka of the swedish standards organization the agency for special needs education in sweden as well as iaap and this is the core group doing the desktop research developing the criteria and then we have a group of pilots um, that are exactly the people working with digital interfaces, either um, developers, designers, but also procurers. So putting the demands on what kinds of digital interfaces you buy into schools. So we have a group of schools, national authorities, educational publishers and content producers, um, testing and also reacting and consulting on, on the work and the criteria. And then we had a set of external stakeholders, which is international standards organizations and disabled persons organizations, um, who also used as a sounding board. I need to just have a sip. So the idea is that all the time we would do some work and then check if we're going in the right direction. So the methodology has very much been a consultation, both with the standardization, end users, stakeholders, um, and then also very much hands-on tests uh, with users on um, prototypes of public digital services and also prototypes um, of textbooks, teaching materials in the digital school environments. So we've been doing consultations and then developing and testing and then going back and forth between those elements. So how did we come up with the criteria? Um, well, there are hundreds of recommendations and what we did as the basis is to do a, a review of more than 50 sources of recommendations in different international standards, but also technical reports from the standardization committees, industry reports, nonprofit recommendations from uh, different types of uh, organizations and projects. And, and within each of these documents, there are perhaps 10 to 20 different guiding points, recommendations. So I would say we have looked at at least three, 400 yeah, individual guiding points. So how would you choose? We can't make 300 um, measurable criteria. It, it would just be madness. So what we did was to look at uh, which of the recommendations are overlapping. And there are quite a lot of recommendations going in the same direction. So we uh, drew up a short list of the ones um, covering the user needs that are most often cited, like focus, for example, um, avoid distractions, these kind of things. 
and then we also had um, through workshopping and testing, we tried to find which ones are the most um, measurable, which ones can we make the most binary. So um, you can actually say yes and no. Is the criteria fulfilled or is it not? So we ended up with criteria in four focus areas of, of needs. And the first one is has to do with organization and structure of the website so that it's clearly structured and uh, it's, not, it's easy to find information. Sorry about that. Um, we also looked at focus. So is it easy to, to find and the information and to stay focused on the task. And then orientation and navigation, which is, um, is it easy to see where you are on the website um, between the different pages? And is it easy if you are in the process of filling in a form, one of these forms at Gareth Haight, um, where you are in the process and what you're supposed to be doing? And then the fourth area that we looked at is consistency. So for example, if you have, one design element at one um, part of the site that, for example, um, activates an audio file, then if you have to activate an audio file in a different part of the website, it should be the same kind of design element that you choose so that um, people can recognize and feel confident with, okay, this is what will happen if I push this button. And all the while we had in mind that we wanted to present this as the gift, the, the criteria we want to present as the gift for standards organizations. So we really had the focus on measurability and we drew up a test methodology for each of the criteria where you can follow different steps to see if the criteria has been fulfilled or not. And then we had a discussion around um, the formulation of the actual criteria because all kinds of standards organizations use different ways of, of presenting their requirements. So the ISO way of doing it is not the W3C way of doing it and not the ETSI way. Um, and we didn't want to go into the whole discussion on, on how it should be formulated if it's, it, it's a, a standard way of doing it. So we have done a neutral formulation of the criteria itself that can then be transformed and adapted into the different standard standardization processes. So this is sort of the approach that we, we went for. And then when the criteria has been developed, of course, it's time to do the testing and the consultation part and all the iterations. So we have done a lot of user testing, um, more than 60 tests now, both in Sweden and abroad. And of course, we usually do quite a lot of on-site and focus groups, and we have been doing a few of these. But because a lot of the testing uh, took place now um, during the pandemic, which is never ending, it seems, um, then we have been doing quite a lot of online testing. And what we did was to do prototypes um, where we implemented the criteria and then the prot a prototype of the same um, interface where the criteria has not been implemented. So we can see um, how this affects the users, if it is easier um, or not. I mean, what is the change when the criteria has been implemented or not? And we both developed generic interfaces like this. Um, generic tax agency. And we've also been working with the actual interfaces of our pilots. So the educational publishers and the national authorities um, that we've been working with in, within the project, we simply made copies of their interfaces with and without the criteria implemented. So we don't have the time now, unfortunately, to go into every one of the criteria we have um five to seven candidates and we're still in the process of selecting the ones that we really think are solid enough but between five and seven will be validated 
And I will just show you one of the examples now, and it's um, the criteria called indication of progress in a visually described task. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have one of these forms that you need to fill out um, on the web, you will need as a user to know how many steps you need to complete, how much time will it take? Um, and you will also need to, to know where you are in the process. And this should be visually described. So if we look at, for example, the prototype where it has not been, where the criteria has not been implemented, we have a form which is a tax agency. And at the top of the form, it simply says, add your details in below fields, and each step is the required field. It doesn't say how many fields you have to complete. Um, and it doesn't say how long time it will take. And the first question is, how much is your income? And here, a user has filled in 2,500 euro as, as the income. Um, but it doesn't say how many questions there are. Is, is this the first question, the third, the fifth? I don't know. And it doesn't give you any feedback on whether or not the information has been correctly completed. And the next question is, how are you paid? And then the person, the user has to fill out, well, it's monthly. But the same again, there is no indication of which order the question is um, and whether the, um, the completion has been accepted um, by the system, if it is okay. So if we look at the prototype where we have implemented the criteria, at the top, it now says that this form consists of four steps and that each step is a required field. I mean, to, to give, actually, what I would add to this is also to, to give an estimated time, but this is not in the criteria, it's just added bonus. If you want to make your users really happen, you should also do an estimation of how much time you need to, to do to complete the form. And for the first question, we have, and that is the question one out of four, how much is your income? And now that the criteria has been completed, there is a check, a tick off saying that, um, the confirming that the, um, and that it has been completed. And the second question, there is also numbering. So it's a question two out of four, how are you paid? And there's also a checkbox um, showing that the person giving a confirmation that and the answer that has been given, that is the monthly payment has been accepted by system. And what you actually cannot see in this prototype is that before, before you fill it in, it's a white background. And now that it has been completed, it's also blue. So, which is an ex extra visual confirmation that the step has been filled out correctly. So the most interesting result, uh, we are still looking through the, the results from the user testing, but what we found most interesting talking to end users and also to our pilots is that even what the well, what our pilots, what the people working in digital interfaces feel are very subtle design changes they actually make a big difference for the users. So, um, I mean, we had the feedback of one of our pilots saying, well, I didn't know that just um, making the design elements more consistent would actually help them to find the information so quickly. So, and I think this is a key issue with cognition um, often, and perhaps, especially if you don't yourself consider yourself to have a cognitive impairment, you don't see what the point is. Why is it so important to have the numbering? You can just uh, imagine yourself, you can just um, yourself find out what the solution is. Um, but this is not the way it works for persons with cognitive impairments, and it's not the way it works for any person under stress, then what you see is what you get. Um, you don't, as a user, you shouldn't have to be able to fill in the gaps yourself. So this is why even subtle designed changes and prompts 
are very helpful. We also tested, of course, the review method. Um, so to make sure that the testing methodology and the criteria is also both understandable and useful, relevant to persons working in digital interfaces. So here we have our pilots, which are stakeholders from private and public sectors. And they are now, um, this is actually still undergoing, but we are wrapping it up now. And it's, um, they have been using the criteria and the review method to uh, make a review on their own website, actually using the criteria to see if the text makes sense and if, if it's usable and relevant. And so far we haven't had any negative responses. So we take this as a validation that they have actually said that, yes, we find the criteria relevant, useful, and also possible to, to implement. So just shortly, a very brief um, takeaways from the, from this project is firstly that we believe we have now validated that cognitive user needs can be captured in measurable criteria um, and that these criteria can be used in legislation. So there's really no excuse um, anymore, what we would say, if there ever were to exclude cognitive accessibility from legislative um, requirements. And then the second part is that we believe also that the method that we have been using in this project could be of use in other types of contexts. So this kind of, of collaborative effort where we do hands-on testing and development of criteria and also consulting with stakeholders, with end users and um, with everybody concerned, this process can also be of use both in research and to complement um, processes of standardizations. So um, even though this is the end of the, the project, we really would like it to be a start of something new. So we are open for any ideas on how we can now use both the criteria and also the method and to put it to good use in, in other contexts. And I would also like to, to say that we will be doing a demonstration website where we have all the prototypes, all the criteria, all the test methodology, and this will be put uh, online, free for everyone to use at the end of the project, um, which is in a one month's time. So we're very busy putting all that together. But then please go on this website and have a look at the criteria and use them, even though they will not be legal requirements now. We hope that they will make themselves into standardization, but they will actually make a big difference to your users on the websites you are developing right now, straight away. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, it will be interesting to have the, the panel discussion. Hey, thank you, Sarah. That was a very good uh, presentation. <clears throat> and also, I think now everyone is very curious and wants to, eager to, to see the, the criteria so really built up some, some expectation for that, which is, which is, of course, good. So um, I would like to invite the panelists to, uh, to put on their videos and the microphones also. If you don't have sleeping, snoring dogs in the background, then you can keep them off. Um, uh, so we have a very, a very distinguished panel with us today to discuss uh, cognitive accessibility, not to, I mean, you are welcome to discuss the, the project as well, of course, but really we wanted you to sort of frame this and, and give another uh, perspective also because this is an, a national project with sort of international ambition um, and we wanted to, to share um, our findings and also a little bit of discussion with, with, the, with the larger community uh, around this. So um, with me today, I have a Gareth for Williams that you have already heard speaking. So I don't think I need to, to uh, introduce him anymore. Uh, I also have Bart de Klerk uh, from, um, I can't pronounce that. Boza, just uh, Boza, yeah. uh, Federal Public Service Boza. Yes. 
So okay. anyway, but I think the interesting part of that agency is that you are actually the monitoring agency for the Web Accessibility Directive. Yes. At least that is what I find most interesting about that agency. So <laughs> you are you are in charge of everything there. And thank you for joining. Well, not me personally, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's you. I think it's you. Uh, so, so thank you for joining us again with the short notice. And then, of course, Shadi Abu Zara, how could we ever discuss anything without you? On board. Also, I think everyone knows who you are, but uh, the one and only person behind the W3C and everything that has to do with accessibility standards in the universe. You're well, getting me in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> but, anyway, you and me both, Shadi. <laughs> <Just. laughs> so, and then, and then now I don't know what to say about Christian, but uh, I guess your your position is to to um, to be the responsible for everything that has to do with. Academy and research, so you will have to be the scientific uh, person here and make sure that the other ones stay on track. Uh, very good to have you here, uh, and I know that your your department and you and your team is doing a, an extremely good job with um, with the research on, on cognition and also in all the other uh, activities and projects that you are involved in. So thank you for joining us today. So I, my first question really um, goes back to what Sarah said, the cliffhanger. Uh, you should know she's also a, a writer, so she knows how to do cliffhangers. So, um, so <laughs> but now we have the sort of expert community here to help us out answering the question, why is it so that the accessibility standards, which are the presumed conformance for the directives and the legislation in Europe today, why are they covering physical uh, disabilities much better than, than the cognitive. Does anyone know that or can we at least have a discussion? I mean, why, why is this the case? Why, are we, why do we need to have this discussion in the first place? Maybe Shadi, you are, you are the standardization person here. So <laughs> we'll let you go first. Thank you, Susanna. First of all, uh, well, first, first of all, uh, after your introduction, I need to say that the working group does the work. I get to speak about it. So. <laughs> Just uh, so the credit of a lot of the uh, of the work, of course, goes to the working group and all the active participants in that. The second thing is uh, congratulations to you and to Sarah. Uh, this sounds like really, really fantastic work and much needed work uh, to help inform uh, further developments and continued development. Now, you had instructed me before to be short. I have about five or six post-it notes uh, filled out <laughs> with lots of reactions and comments. I, I will make it as brief as possible and I'm really sorry, but this is such an important topic and so exciting, um, at least for me personally, uh, that I think it really deserves um, uh, a, a little bit of, of, of uh, let, let me give a, a, few, a few things. Um, first of all, um, I would like to say, I think way over 60% of the requirements in WCAG relate to people with cognitive and learning disabilities. Okay, there are requirements in there on headings, levels, instructions, consistency, content, uh, moving content, background audio, uh, timeouts, authentication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not going to go through all of them because we don't have the time, right? Now that doesn't mean that we're done or anywhere near. Um, there's much more needed. And I think Gareth put it really well, you know, one person with a cognitive <laughs> learning disability, you only know one person, right? I think the field of cognitive accessibility is just so diverse and so individual uh, that it needs much more, right? And we need to think much broader. And I, I like the thought of, we in the accessibility community always say accessibility pushes the boundaries and, and, and asks, developers and designers to be more innovative. Maybe within the accessibility community, <laughs> cognitive accessibility is what's pushing us to look for more innovative approaches and different ways of thinking about accessibility itself because accessibility is not solved for any disability. I think Sarah mentioned that quite nicely. The text alternative is a great example of even how for blind people, um, you know, we're far from having served their needs, right? All we say is provide a text alternative, but how good is a text alternative is a question that is still um, quite quite difficult to answer uh, with the current standards. I'm being very open here and I know I'm being recorded, right? 
um, so um, that is the truth that I don't think all disabilities are covered. We sometimes picture, you know, that some disabilities are taken care of, others are not. I, I myself am quadriplegic, as you know, Suzanne. <laughs> I think many of my requirements are not met. Uh, just having big buttons that I can press, uh, especially when I'm using a mobile device. Um, this is something that, uh, you know, um, impacts me personally every day. So I think we need to move, you know, raise the floor, push the borders, push the boundaries in accessibilities across the whole field. And I think we can learn a lot from accessibility, uh, for, from cognitive accessibility. One thing that Sarah said is about measurability. And right now, WCAG 2, the WCAG 2 model looks at measurability in a binary approach. Is it met or is it not met? One of the things that is being explored in WCAG 3 is maybe a scaled measure. And the analogy in my mind is, how big of a barrier is this, <laughs> right? And again, this applies to text alternative for, 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 for blind people. It applies to me in the physical world when I'm thinking, okay, a very, very steep ramp or a broken elevator is for me an exclusion criteria. A little bit of a steep ramp is maybe less ideal, but maybe not excluding. Um, so maybe we need to think more about a scaled approach. And that's actually what's happening in WCAG 3. So maybe new ways of thinking about how we can, um, as, as Sarah put it, formulate requirements, right? There isn't actually a W3C way of writing requirements. Uh, we are rethinking it in WCAG 3. It's an opportunity here where we can try to look at um, how to write requirements uh, from scratch. Um, and we really invite, you were asking what, what's the next step, um, open invitation here to really come and help us uh, do work. Um, one last thing I wanna put, uh, and, and just, just so that I don't take too much time. Um, I also wanna talk, talk about the technology stack, right? Um, not everything in society can be fixed with technology, uh, but at the same time also, not everything in accessibility can be fixed with guidelines, uh, right? Um, there are different, I think, different pieces that need to fit together. One is the guidelines themselves and what can we put as guidelines as requirements, but what other content, uh, what, what other um, technological advances can we use? Now, one of the things about uh, cognitive and learning disabilities is it's so individual, as I said earlier, and there's work at W3C on, for example, personalization. So being able to personalize websites even more to a larger degree, right? We see that things are really, really highly personal. Um, for example, the red background that Garrett was using, uh, which is maybe comfortable for him uh, to highlight something. Uh, no, okay, <laughs> you were using that red a lot. <laughs> yeah, for me, that was exactly the same reaction. But anyway, the point is, um, <laughs> for it me, the kept me going. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe Susanna should put a red slide now for me so I can I stop. <laughs> no, but the, the point is, um, I, I think we know this, that, that we need to have more possibilities of personalizing the content uh, because um, even what is easy to read or what is text will very, be very different from one person to the other. And maybe we need here mechanisms. This brings me to the third point, which is also new technologies, tooling, uh, both in the authoring side, natural language processing and grammar tools and things that help authors author proper content, but also on the user side, the things to help uh, use the text or, or use the content more easily. One really, really last point, Susanna. I need to, I need to stop you because you, you still didn't answer the question. So my question was, why is it that the regulations are not covering uh, cognitive better. So do you challenge that by saying WCAG is already about cognition. So the, the, the I don't know how to put this in English, but, but the, the premise okay. for the question is wrong. No, no, um, no, the, the, no, I was, I was challenging the comparison that for certain types of disabilities, it's good. And for others, it's, it, it, it's not, uh, I want to say it's, it's bad for a lot of people. Um, okay, and fine. yeah, okay. okay. So to answer your question, I think Greg van der Heiden put it in a good way, uh, which I think he was citing Clayton Lewis <laughs> uh, in saying, we haven't figured out ways of writing these requirements 
well enough yet. And for example, the the, the what the, the the requirement that Sarah proposed um, about um, providing the steps in in a form which sounds really logical and really good. There were already people in the chat. Um, challenging that sometimes the process is not one dimensional and you know the exact steps along the way, but it's multidimensional. You actually cannot say how many steps will be there. So this is part of developing the requirements in a broad environment for developing standards like WCAG. We literally develop, get thousands of comments that we address because it needs to be broadly applicable to many kinds of websites in many situations. So it's hard work. Um, that's the answer to your question. We haven't figured out yet a way of putting these requirements. And another part is sometimes we don't know the user needs. Such research work like you're doing and others, um, that's what's needed to help inform what's needed. And then we need to figure out a way to put it in broadly applicable standards. Thank you. When you are now taking a breath, I will leave the floor to someone else to speak. Thank you, Shadi. There was really good, a lot of good stuff. I know you can talk about this for two hours, but it's supposed to be channels. I need to. I need to move on to someone else. Yeah. So, Gareth, you are very, very, very uh, polite and raise your hand. So, I need to give the floor to you. But I won't let you speak as long as Shadi did because you already had your fifteen minutes. So, but what was your comment? Oh my God! Yeah, you. you the the last thing you want is to to leave it. Leave me on. <laughs> I'll go on for forever. I can talk for England. So, I think I think there's a whole bunch of stuff that Shadi brought up there, and I think th there's a very important point that about the barriers is that often we don't have the data to define the barriers possibly enough. We're all solutions people. We work in accessibility and we want to fix things. And we try to go to solutions before we understand the problems. And this is sometimes, particularly in this area, we don't have the data and people mix up anecdote with data and we end up with bad solutions. And there's a lot of that in particularly around cognitive accessibility, which is why we have all these dreadful fonts that don't actually do anything for anyone and there's no data to support them. You know, that, that's a real massive bugbear of mine. It's like, give me the data, show me this is even real. And it's like, well, my mate Colin quite liked it. And it's like, that's not data, that's, that's not evidence. And so there's huge problems. I wanna quote someone, uh, this guy took, uh, some of you will know Dieter Rams, a brilliant product designer from, who's still around, still with us influenced obviously you know Jonathan Ives to build you know to design everything that he designed for Apple and you know he designed Braun products and he said the one and only cardinal sin in design is not designing for the reality in which people live and I think cognitive accessibility sits within that reality because it's partly to do with condition as a lot of accessibility does in other places partly to do with condition but it's also environment and situation we don't live in labs and this is why lab testing is always a little bit problematic with this but if you, I mean, there's one, my daughter who's a UX designer asked me once about cognitive accessibility. And she said, do you have any data from anywhere like Uber? Because after 10 o'clock at night, everyone who's using Uber is cognitively disabled. You know, we're either exhausted, we're tired or other. And, and so then they, they must have some research around this because their entire user base is hitting within this group. And I actually approached them and they didn't have anything. That was quite a number of years ago. Um, but I've noticed it's interesting that some of those types of apps that uh, are dealing around time do things like increase ta uh, target sizes late at night because they're expecting people to not to become situationally and environmentally disabled. And so we're still understanding this at the time. You know, if you're in a conversation with someone and you're distracted, you're cognitively disabled at that point. There's all sorts of situations around this. So unpicking this pulling data together behind it and bring those contexts into this amazing work that you're doing and is happening in the COGA working group. We've been doing a bit of pieces and having those communities bring this together, I think we'll unpack this. But I think the reason it's not been done, mixture of data and it's also history. You know, as, a, as I mean, I'm just about to leave the BBC, but I've been part of an accessibility program that's 85 years old and it's only just started dealing with this. And, you know, we started trying to design wirelesses for the blind in the 1940s and doing the first Envision signing in the 1957 uh, for TV, because it just, that's the way it built up. And it's a historical growth of accessibility within media and content delivery. And we're now at this stage where we can actually start having these conversations. 
Done. Thank you, Gert. I think you, you're not building the, the business case for cognitive accessibility with the Uber uh, reference. So that's that's really good. So if, oh. if data is, we don't, we lack the data. So Christian, you are in the research field. Why don't we have the data on this? If, if that is the case, just as a, because that is what I'm trying to pull out of this uh, long answers I get. <laughs> we don't know. So is, is that true? We don't know about enough. We we don't know enough, but I mean, I coming back to your question, I would you'd start a little bit earlier on, because in my opinion, one of the big reasons is that people with cognitive problems have not as strongly raised their voices as other user groups did. Maybe they couldn't do it or whatever, but in, in practically, uh, practical, they and their requirements haven't been realized for long. In the public, and that is still, I mean, from my perspective, they have just, you know, didn't merely exist in in the conscious of, of the general public. And then uh, it comes, secondly, um, the role of the intermediaries of saying, oh, they are not for the internet. This is so complicated. And the second thing is, oh, the is too dangerous for them letting them in and and that's just you know cyberspace is closed for these people and uh, one thing has been said uh, again for the reasons why we don't have it uh, it is easy to you know to check whether this box is there or not or the alternative text is as you said but it's much more difficult to talk about understanding is this really understandable who can understand what and this makes it so difficult to come up with testable, reliable criteria to say what is understandable. And then, you know, you know one person rather than a complete group is so heterogeneous and that's the reasons behind that. So we need more data um, and we need more exploration. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very interested in to see your, your criteria. I'm, I'm not completely convinced whether the criteria like you presented it will completely solve the problem but it might be a very good step in, in going into the right direction i don't think that our uh, aim was to solve uh, all problems at least but try to to show that there are problems that can be fixed just to challenge the idea that this is so difficult but if we go to the public sector i mean we have tried to try to test this with the end user of course and then the public sector bodies who are maybe uh, would be covered by legislation if this ever this or other cognitive criteria ever reaches uh, the standards and then and of course the um, the ict um, suppliers who also need to implement this we have tried to talk to everyone to see if this is sort of doable or not so we have the public sector here with us with bart um, okay, yeah. what, what's your what's your take on this well basically i'm glad this is called a panel and not a debate because uh, I, I don't really have all that much to, I think a lot of be, that's been said by all of all three of you. It's, it's correct. It's, there's some history behind it. There are, and I, I, in my own notes, I said there are quite a few WCAG criteria which are relating to cognition already, like Shadi said. Uh, at the same time, I think one of the things that, that, that does cause problems is that it's in general, and it's still a simplification, but it's easier for a non-disabled person to imagine physical disabilities uh, as a simplification. Obviously, you can close your eyes and be blind. You can turn off the sound and you're deaf. You can change some screen settings to reduce your contrast. You can navigate through a keyboard to not be able to manipulate a mouse. It's an oversimplification, but it's a real one. It's virtually impossible to pretend to have a cognitive disability and make any conclusions about that. I can't, in my head, become uh, Gareth. I can't feel what he feels. I can't, uh, but I can do roughly, he very roughly that to. for a blind, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that for a blind person. I can try using a computer with my eyes closed. It's, it's an imperfect comparison. It's always an imperfect comparison, but it's a lot closer than I can get with cognitive disabilities. This makes it- But you could, I mean, following Gareth's idea, you can get drunk. Yeah, but like he said, you meet one cognitive disabled person and you meet a second one and it's completely different. Drunk, at least there are the advantages that's pretty similar across the board, but it's just one. It's, it's the equivalent of meeting one particular disabled person, cognitive disabled person. A, I, th I think we should. I, I think we should get together and test this out. <laughs> yeah, Mysterious. Sounds like a very good plan. <laughs> Post COVID, yeah, I think it's, we need absolutely. to get funding. 
So I think it's it's harder to capture the accessibility features required in easy um, in easy rules in part because it's very hard to empathize with cognitive disability because you can't in your head become that person. And I'm not saying I can become a blind person simply by closing my eyes. I, eyes. I mean, there are a lot of types of blindness. You have people who are blind from birth, people who became blind. So it's not the same, but it's a lot closer than I can get to a than I can get to a cognitive disability. And that makes it, I think, harder to imagine those rules, to, to figure out those rules. And I think also at the same time, the cognitive disability might in itself make it harder for that cognitive disability disabled person to themselves suggest the rules that would apply. So it's it's a it's it's a it's a it's an issue on, on both sides. And and I think that makes it harder uh, to get those criteria, to get those standards, which in a, in consequence also means that they are less likely to be included in a comprehensive manner. And at, at, that's I think that's part of the reason and history absolutely Gareth uh, nailed it there I mean even even WCAG and, and such WCAG one already included cognitive criteria but I think that the initiatives the initial initiatives initiatives certainly were from from the point point of view of blind point of view is a strange expression there but from blind people and and such uh, I'm sorry I, I want to challenge that I I I uh... I mean, that, that, that was my first point because I'm really feeling nervous, this kind of segregation and saying, you know, here are people with disabilities and here are people with cognitive and learning disabilities. I, I, I don't think that's a useful approach. Um, I, I, I do really subscribe to the, uh, you know, universal design, inclusive design, ca call it whatever term you want. Um, people with cognitive and learning disabilities very often have neurological and motor disabilities and you know have have, have certain uh, and, and and vice versa have have visual disabilities um kind of i think we need to see humans on a spectrum of abilities with different degrees and and trying to look at approaches that will fit everything together i think this kind of separation and saying this group you know is is uh, more or less or something. I mean, there's definitely things to it in, in terms of involving people with disabilities. And I think, but this applies to the whole community, you know, nothing about us without us <laughs> as a disability community. Mm. I think um, most of my quadriplegic friends have no idea about technology and would not be able to formulate any requirements, but how do we involve people with disabilities in the design of requirements and standards? And I think as Gareth put it, you know, give me the data, we, we need the data, we need more research in the field to better understand uh, the actual requirements and then to formulate them in a way that is measurable. And here mm -hmm. measurable uh, doesn't have to be binary. Um, I, that's what the group is exploring. Don't get me wrong, Ash. I, I was looking at it historically. I mean, right. there yeah. it's, it's true that I, especially what Garrett said 85 years ago, disability, Cognitive disability was not considered, I guess, for most people, a, a disability. It, it was, and, I mean, and, and, I, is, can we, can we, yeah, okay. Yeah. So we, we were a radio let's company. Let's move on to the, to the uh, yeah, that was, yeah, it was a... all very, very <laughs> interesting. Sarah, do you want to comment on this? Because I think, I think it's quite interesting that, that we, we have these people that I really respect and, and think very highly of, and still it, it's really, um, and also in the chat, you can see very clearly that people are very stuck in what they think. So I think, what we maybe can do with this project result is really to stir the pot a bit and maybe challenge some of these views because I think that is our, what that was our aim and hopefully we will um, continue with that. But do you want to comment on on all these clever um, things? Actually, two two things about these individual approaches. I think that we are everyone is different. So I, I'm I'm not buying the argument that because there are so many different people that have different kinds of cognitive um, issues and that nobody is the same within the spectrum, then it becomes much more difficult to do anything. I think what we have seen in this project and what certainly was an eye opener for me is that there are many common needs as well. And no, we're not going to solve everything, but let's not that become a barrier for not doing anything. 
So what we tried to do, I mean, we looked at four, four or 500 recommendations and we saw that, okay, this doesn't fit in to the binary. I'm really happy, Shadi, that you said that it doesn't have to be binary because this is a, really an area for us to explore. Um, but also, no, we cannot solve everything for er everyone. And this is actually what we have been seeing in the projects we are doing. We have been doing this project, which is trying to solve some issues that are common for most people or for a lot of people. And then we have a different research project where we have been working on personalization, uh, which is also very important for some people um, with cognitive disabilities. But um, I'm not really buying this argument that because cognition is so broad and everyone is so different, we cannot make standards out of it. I mean, uh, so uh, if so can we can we try to not have this, like a <laughs> big debate about small things? I just want everyone to be able to <laughs> sure. to say what they what they think, and I I think we we can uh, agree to disagree, or maybe it's a question of not having the time to discuss it enough because I know we're also in agreement on many things, and it's sometimes terminology and and things like that and perspectives, but but. I think most of us at least think that it's um, we need to have more data and it would be good if we could also try to overcome this and, and solve the gaps. Uh, and, and I'm sure that this project will, will not be uh, solving everything, but hopefully we can, we can start somewhere and, and do something. And I know, of course, there's a lot of other good work going on in many different uh, places and let's just try to work together to see if we can if we can move forward on this, uh, because I, I think we also see that many people are really engaged in this and want want to solve it. So um, uh, my timing for this uh, has gone absolutely not, it's not working anymore. So that was, that's a good thing. Because many people have lots to say, but let me just try to, to, to end the panel discussion with, with a more positive and forward leaning a question so that we don't get stuck in the in the sort of in the past and in the problems because I really like to be we we always pride ourselves with being the solution people so um so Bart um how can we what can we do to overcome I mean I call it a gap Shadi doesn't want to call it a gap but we can call it something well, uh, it's, we, it's, we know it's, it's we, a gap it's just it's not the only gap that exists but it's a gap let's put it that way but it's not a gap between the current rule set and uh, and uh, and that group, it's more of a gap, an absolute gap. It's, it's I, I think more attention and publication of user testing with such users and, and, and testing with the kind of work you're going to do with the, the website in a, in a month, that can help in coordination with, with field expert scientists. Because, because of that empathy, empathy issue, I think that can help uh, uh, raise away awareness at the theoretical and the practical less, uh, level and specific pushes to help raise the discourse on that. And I think WCAG is a really, or, or the, the W3C is, is a key place to do that. Because as, when I look at Europe, at least, for the, for the detail of the policy work, so, so the, the practical implementation, everything looks back to WCAG. Uh, the EU norm and the Web Accessibility Directive, for example, in the end, it all comes down to referring to WCAG for the accessibility criteria defined therein and try to follow up on those as, as a cornerstone, as the, the cornerstone of the whole uh, rules and regulation thing. So if you can work into that, that is key long-term, I think, for enhancing uh, accessibility uh, for, for everybody. Uh, and uh, it's it's, in, in a way, it's a dull thing. I think it's the, the guidelines and, and advice and, and so on is very useful, but it is only really useful for people who are already motivated to do it, which hopefully is a big and growing group. But there will always be a big and, uh, a big and significant group who will only be pushed forward through, through rules and regulations and who will need that, that, that anchor of things like the WCAG criteria or something similar to uh, to advance significantly. Yeah, that, and, yeah. Well, that's that's definitely true. I mean, to get the volume of this, so the sort of scaling up, you need the the, the legal part. I, I agree with you. But if we could make um, so we have a change of of sign language interpreter. Here we are. Um, so if we could make the um, 
the larger community to understand that what we today call cognitive criteria, whatever that is, um, uh, is sort of useful for everyone and helpful and so on. Would it be, do you think just from a public sector agency perspective, would it be possible if, if that was sort of common knowledge, even if it wasn't legislated, if people understood that making the website easier or the service easier for, um, for this, these target audiences would actually make it sort of faster, more efficient and better for everyone? Because I think this is really sort of to combine uh, it, with, it, first thing it, with empathy. It would, but I've, if we're talking about an actual gap and how big of an impact you can have, I think the actual impact of that will on the whole be much smaller at that level than, than having it feed back into rules and regulations. I, I'm, it makes Sometimes it makes me sad to have to say things like that because I'm personally motivated and I'm personally very interested in going beyond the rule sets and in all my communications with that, we're the, the monitoring body and I frequently get questions about, well, if we do it like this, is that okay then? And often my answer is, well, technically you will then be following the rules, but, and then I give a lot, a lot of arguments on why you should try something, try to be better than that, to not just follow the letter of the law, but to try to actually approach accessibility as I want to make this accessible to people, not I want to be conformant to this or that criterion. Mm. But I have no real levers to force them to do that. And if they have to choose people, a lot of people will choose the easy way out. Yeah, my, my logic to this question was just, or behind it was just that if, if the problem is that we don't have the data and we don't have the knowledge, if, if somebody, the society could provide that data, if it was kind of a common knowledge, not only in the legislation, not only in a standard that you need, I agree that you need to be specifically interest, interested in accessibility to get, but if it was sort of common knowledge that this is how you do it, because we know that the logo is usually up in the, to the left and the footer is, I mean, there are some sort of really not standards, but standardized ways of yeah, doing yeah, yeah. informal standards. Could, but yeah. Hey, you know, th this is one of these big problems and we're building things on, you know, on operating systems where they put a start button in for shutting it down. You know, and, and so you, you find, you know, there are huge cognitive problems. Even I, I can't tell you how long the first time I got a Windows machine, I think it was three hours before I le I've actually just pulled the plug out the wall because I couldn't work out to switch it off. Uh, going back in the day, it was just it just made no sense. But I think this is the problem. It's 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 a mixture. I totally agree, you know, with with everything that everyone said, there, there's some really good points in here, but you know, it's going beyond. Guidelines are a really good starting point and they're a good place to think. And they're kind of a foundation thing. And they're a foundation that's a work in progress because they're constantly evolving, changing. We're adding new data in, they're growing and there's a discussion around them and they stimulate discussion. It's not just about compliance. I always like to say compliance is not an answer to any other question except, is it compliant? You've got to stick the user at the front of it. You know, these are user experience designers that are building these. If they don't understand the user, they're never going to be able to build an experience that will work for it. And as Jamie always likes to say, and I'll bring Jamie into the, you know, we, we sit in UX and D within BBC for accessibility because nothing is inaccessible until we design and build it. We, we create disability through our choices that we make as designers and that is the, where the problem is. Um, we have a nice little technique that we like to sometimes use is at the beginning of a project, say, who are we willing to exclude? Make a list and don't add to that list in any of the choices that you make. And if you do, go back and make a, dis a different decision. Mm. It's a really neat way of doing it, but this is a design problem. And it's about, you know, thinking about the fact that people are complicated, our environments are complicated, our situations are complicated, designed for those complexity, exactly what Dieter Rams was talking about. And I think he said that in the early 1970s, you know, yeah. he, he I, I totally think, got it. It's I think people. the same thing actually holds, you can expand the reasoning. I mean, we need to design our rules and regulations for that as well, because people uh, it, it's 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 very similar i mean if you know that many people will only do what's regulated then you need to design your regulations in such a, in such a way that it stimulates the people to do the right thing yeah. and that's also hard yeah it is. making it is. standards standards and, and and regulations accessible that's that's an, a whole other topic but <laughs> but i agree can with you, you do a session on that 
<laughs> yeah, we, what I what I pick up from you, Gareth, is that we need to need to educate people. So at least, and I would like to to sort of focus on educating the people who are at university now or soon, so that at least the next generation gets to have this in their blood and DNA. So that's one answer at least. And Christian, I know you have been working a lot with engaging and involving use end users uh, in in research. So can you say something about? How that works, yeah. and, and I mean that because that is, I think, also something that has been picked up that these target audiences are are rarely in standardization and are rarely in sort of product development and and research and so on. So could you say something mm -hmm. about that? Okay, I just want to say something on from the chat, and because that's very true. I mean, what what we need is of more, as I said, organized advocacy for for this work and for for that what we want to achieve. Um, and and uh, if it comes to research, data collecting, and whatever it is, and also technical developments, um, it is indeed um, also an, uh, a challenge to to bring researchers together from the technology side, from the uh, computer science, and whatever it is, and also from people with disabilities side, in particular if it comes to cognitive problems. Um, there's a very little understanding between these two groups, um, and uh, it is an effort for everyone involved to do it. Uh, but we have done it in several projects, and we come up with the, let me say, uh, the experience that um, in the end we learned a lot from the users which we didn't expect. One of the examples I can make is, you know, we made a very very simple interface we really thought it's very simple we made it but the people required it even more simple i never thought about it i said was that was boring uh, and actually if you work with it for a long time it will be boring so you have to have something you know upgrading and uh, something but we never went down to such a simple solution as they required i never or we never had made this experience uh, or the finding without talking to the people very closely in the process because we were in the end not you know here is now the design and try to evaluate it but we were just in the beginning and they uh, could um, intervene and say no this is much too complicated and this is something uh, we we need to uh, work on methods I mean we have done a project where, where we had tried to uh, develop methods and apply methods how to do this better um, I'm not saying we have found, um, you know, uh, the golden key, uh, but I think we have to work in this direction even even more because, particularly in this area, and it's, it's, you know, all the the users themselves they know uh, what they need. And I come back to the point of the personalization. I still believe that this is a very important issue, which we have to work on. And um, finally, also to technology, because I mean standards and regulation everything's fine but my working in this field for some years now I, I say the technology is changing so rapidly and it's you know providing us new opportunities to overcome current problems like you know if you use AI um, machines for for translations and so on we are not yet there but we have to take this uh, you know uh, as, a, as a vision and work on it uh, and so we have the side of the rules and the regulations on one hand, but on the other side is, you know, make the best of the technology we have and take the best technology we have as far as we can. Yeah, and then, so I, I agree with you. And then also the technological development is also as such uh, making troubles because we need to learn a lot about new things all the time. So at least I feel very, very tired sometimes when things get updated and, <laughs> and changed. Uh, I guess that's a sign of age, so let's not talk about that. I will let you have 30 seconds to say something really clever, Shadi. If you want to say positive, something, yes. so, so, yeah. something clever. Yes. No. <laughs> if, the, if, the, if, the, if the answer is uh, everyone should join W3C and standardization is the answer to everything, then, that, then your time is up. But if you have another sort of uh, angle on the, um, how do we solve this or how do we improve the situation? Forward leaning. So yeah, I mean, definitely in, in, in involving p 
people with disabilities, people with cognitive and learning disabilities, working with them. If my earlier comments were in any way understood that, you know, it's enough and we don't need to do more, that's not the point. WTC has been really investing a lot in this, and, and this is, um, since WCAG won, this has been a focus area, and we need to do much more, and, and not only us, but, but the whole community. So, so I agree with all this. Uh, and the, the other aspect, in addition, is, you know, the, these requirements, there is no free lunch and it is something that is hard to do. It doesn't mean we should give up or there is no, we, we, we shouldn't do it. Uh, we shouldn't continue trying, uh, but it has to stand up. It has to be stuff that, that can be applied on different kinds of websites in, 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 in practice and so on. And this is uh, where WTC brings these different stakeholders together um, industry partners, uh, researchers, uh, people with disabilities, etc., to kind of really try to shake these out. It's a very rigorous process um, in order to find requirements at the end that, that really are uh, broadly applicable. Um, so um, yes, Susanna, this is the invitation. <laughs> Thank you, Kshadi. I think we've been through this before. <laughs> Always good to have you on the panel. So Sarah, <laughs> do you have any, any closing words before we end, uh, open up for the questions from the audience? So what, 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 how do we go from here? I know we have loads of ideas of new projects and so on, so I don't, I don't require you to, to, to uh, detail that, but, but just to uh, sort of what's your view on now this being the sort of first step? So what, what would you like to see in the future? I think this is actually something that we agree on that we need to speak more across different sectors and, and between and involve the users in any way we can. And I'm thinking also about the educational part we are involved in, in other projects where we are trying to get web accessibility into ICT education. And this is really about the culture change that people are talking about in, in the chat. It's not only cognitive accessibility, but really to get um, persons working professionally with digital interfaces to understand that there is actually a user who is going to use it from their perspective, not from what is most interesting in the, in the engineering or design or, or whatever um, background you, you have yourself. So yeah, more collaboration and more um, yeah, sort of Let's talk more to each other. I think that will make the world a better place. Yeah, definitely. And also I would add to talk to others because sometimes, I mean, it's no matter how much I enjoy talking with this group, we do know each other. And we, I mean, even if, if we can discuss these things, we, we know that this is important and we work for it. And, and the most challenging thing is to reach the others. So if every one of us leaves this webinar today and then go start talking to two or three people that are not yet uh, convinced then this will spread in a better way so thank you very much we do have some some specific questions uh, from the audience and I may have missed some in the chat because it's so much going on but very happy to see that that uh, there is a live discussion going on on the side of the panel as well but it's just that is a little bit too um, difficult for me from a cognitive perspective to think that I can do two things at once, which is uh, listen and read, and also sometimes speak. I do sometimes believe I can do it, but I know I can't. So this is a question for Sarah. Um, were any of the user tests done in Finland? Um, I don't have all the, I, I, I don't think so. But if you have a user group in Finland, please contact us <laughs> so we can do more tests. I know we were in, in contact with um, uh, two of the disability organizations that we have are uh, usually working with in Finland, but I don't know if they were going to participate because we had some tests in Swedish and then we did tests in, in English. And we are also doing uh, German uh, tests, I know, or tests in German, but we haven't had the uh, resources to do all the, I mean, to translate to all different EU or all the worlds. Um, languages, unfortunately, that's not, we don't have that um, big a project, but very good question. And we're always happy to, to reach out to Finland. So but it needs to be people who can do the tests in either Swedish and, and or, uh, or English, but please do reach out. And then we have another question for Sarah. How many criteria have been developed that are defined and measurable and where can we find them? Um, so we are still validating the final ones. I mean, the, the project is ending end of April and we uh, have seven criteria 
where we have test methodologies and where we are doing the tests. It could be that one or two of them will fall out in the end of the user testing. Uh, we are building this demonstration uh, website as well that will be available in April. And uh, we need to find a way to get this information out to everyone who attended this. But it will be, there will be a link from the project website and we will also make a lot of promotion on that. And I guess that will also steer up some, some uh, dust and we will, I'm sure we will have a lot of comments and ideas uh, when we do publish this. So please welcome, we're always welcoming more comments and, and questions and, and so on. So I think even if that will be the end of this project, hopefully it will also be the start of something new. Um, so another question for Sarah, can you give an idea of how much of these 50 recommendations you think could be made into measurable requirements and how much of it has been covered in the project? Ooh, I mean, it's a tiny percentage that has been in, in the, covered in the project. And it's really difficult because a lot of the recommendations that we looked at, um, this was really year one of the project. So it's a few years back and I don't have that good memory. Um, so um, how much would be measurable? Well, it's, um, I guess it depends on how you put the definition of, of measurable. If we just keep, keep sort of binary, then we have this small, small, um, smaller segment. But if we go into Shadi's direction here and, and they have a different approach of how we define what measurable is, then it could be larger. So I don't really dare to put a percentage of this, but my feeling is that it's more than we think. Uh, in, in fact, a lot of the things that we, we, we have been having a lot of discussions around in the project is about text because it, understanding is usually what we're trying to understand is textual information and um, easy to read is one of the things that regularly comes, comes back and it's noted from being difficult to be measurable, but I, I still believe that it can be, even in, in some cases, can be defined as measurable as well. So the sky is the limit, I would say, without giving any, <laughs> any commitment to actually doing it. But, but uh, yeah, this is to see how much um, could be measurable is a completely new project. But, what, but just to give a little bit of context, maybe we, I mean, we did uh, the literature review and then the mapping, and then we tried to group recommendations that sort of are similar, similar to each other. So I think we may be able to, to say something about the groups um, when we end the projects, at least. Yeah, well, with the short list uh, from which we, we uh, um, selected the seven criteria to work on is about 55, yeah, around 50 requirements and they were grouped into eight areas so um, in addition to the four we had actually had text and we had help functions um, as well where there is a WCAG criteria and level um, AAA that we want to push up to AA um, so yeah I would say if we look at the, the short list is between, it's around 50 criteria that we looked at out of the three, 400 on the original list. And then we have a question that maybe for everyone or for Shadi, why are we still at the first step with so many things in accessibility after having WCAG for over 20 years? Are people who purchase web properties just not aware and we need billboards and TV spots? Do we need to sponsor a football team like UNICEF does? That's a really good question. <laughs> does anyone want to, to answer that or reflect on it? The football team. It I think to expect us to be any further than we are in our understanding and what we're delivering is a difficult thing because it's a constantly moving feast. You know, I, I always say that my job would be really easy if people stopped inventing things. <laughs> and, you know, th this is the problem. Innovation is continuously happening. There are constantly new ideas and we're working and we're move, trying to move with that and trying to actually create this context of universality around it. And so W3C is staying in pace and trying to understand that and, and it constantly opens up and new contexts and new products and new, you know, all sorts of th things happening. And when you're trying to be universal, 
an agnostic in what W3C is, it's an enormous challenge. You've got to look at what they're trying to do. It's huge. And, and so, you know, this is it. It's keeping pace with change is the reason why it's constantly being refreshed and discussed and explored. And we're learning more about ourselves, not just about technologies. You know, there wasn't screening in mainstream schools until, you know, relatively recently for things like ADHD and even ADHD. We're not quite sure whether that's one thing or many things that all have a kind of shared characteristic. You know, we're still understanding the conditions. And so, you know, it, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, I've only worked in accessibility for about 17 years or something like that. And the change that's happened just in that period of time has been phenomenal, um, you know, in the way that we've come forward. But it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. But yeah, it's, it's a constantly moving thing. And uh, it, it's so, you know, that, that, that's, that's the challenge in it. And you're always working in a framework of other people's ideas and technology. Yeah, very <laughs> and true, very true. Shadi? Want to add, if I, if I may, yeah, I mean, uh, even though I'm a technologist and, and a st standardization, a workforce standardization, uh, I, I think accessibility is changing society much more than the technologies or the, the, the standards and so on. I think that's, that's really something that we shouldn't forget. Um, you know, I see the future as more inclusive, more diverse, <laughs> and um, I think we're, you know, just, just at the beginning and there are many invisible disabilities or disability or conditions. Uh, we didn't even talk about behavioral disabilities and, and other things. Uh, I mean, th th there's still a lot more to do and a lot more. Um, so um, whether it's the first step or a little bit of baby steps that we have accomplished, uh, that's, that's a matter of perspective, but there's definitely much more still to do. Yeah, Christian, do you have any thoughts on why we yeah, I mean, are not uh, moving faster? Yeah. Uh, we have a fast moving target and as you know from rocket science we get this dog curve and that's what happens here uh, we are always running behind if we would find a mechanism to get up front uh, and i remember things you know when when i started in this in, in this area working we were trying to make telephone public telephones accessible we have no public telephones anymore but we're still still running behind the new kind of things we have now that's what's happening, getting up front and maybe um, like uh, more general criteria, like like the principles and so on. These are things, you know, which if we can foster more on that and say, kind of think about this before you do something, that could be maybe um, a way to get closer, getting up front rather than running behind. Bart, do you have a view on why we are still running behind? will always be running behind. <laughs> it'll, it, it'll never be enough. It'll never be fast enough. It will never go far enough. It, it will, in, in 100 years, we'll be having the same discussion, which is not a motivation for giving up. It's, 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 it's more, it's, it's, a, it's an arms race. Oh, you muted yourself. Yeah, I muted myself. Uh, I, where we are today on the web, in many ways, it's way, way better than where we were 10 years ago. I think nobody can deny it. But we have a very long way to go, and we have to make sure that we don't regress, because the regression is a real risk, because technologies change, evolve. New technologies don't necessarily uh, provide more, but better accessibility than the past. But if we can in infuse an accessibility culture, and I think the, I was following the discussion thread, and I think that's, that's part of it is uh, we need to advance and there are many methods and many mechanisms to do that. Regulations obviously is one of them, uh, data. And I think for going back to the cognitive disabilities discussion or, or I think data is indeed key. Uh, data references, examples, uh, good practices uh, will bring us forward, but it's an illusion to think that we'll ever get a fully accessible web, even for government websites where it's legally mandated now in, in Europe, it's an illusion. But if chasing that illusion gets us to a much higher level of accessibility on the whole, then that's, that's a re that, that chasing that illusion is a good thing. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I'm always, I mean, we always wonder every year when we are planning our training sessions, we are asking ourselves, how come we still need to do the introduction on accessibility after 20 years? Why we still need still to do it in 20 it? years? Yeah, <laughs> and another yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. years to say. But but I mean, it. I think I mean I I also see really that things have changed, and I, I think more about society and and people's behavior and and how people with disabilities are are sort of approached in society. That that really has changed during my lifetime as well, at least. Um, but I'm I'm actually with with Eric Egert here who who posed the question uh, that I'm surprised that it doesn't move faster. I, I realize technology is moving faster, and we will always be behind in a technology uh, way, technological way. But I'm still wondering how how it is that the society at large doesn't understand that accessibility is needed or that people are diverse. I mean, how how come we still need to discuss that? That, that is really to me, very Ooh, that's, strange. that's a huge one. I mean, again, <laughs> you can look at everything from the education system to all sorts of there's so many societal factors for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I grew up, there were no disabled children in mainstream schools in mainstream education. It just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And, there, you know, and, and so people grew up not knowing other people. And of course, there's that, that creates problems further down the line. I was kind of lucky because I actually grew up on a flat above a residential disabled school in South Manchester that took on all of the disabled kids that the other special needs schools couldn't deal with. And they were my friends that I played with every day after school, you know, and they, you know, we lived together. It was a big family thing. I had that and I see that as a privilege. And, but I see myself as a bit odd in that respect because I know so many people in my generation who have had no experience mm -hmm. and therefore they really struggle to abstractly think and deal with it and then it's not that they don't want to they that that op, that was taken away from them when they were young because society and society is changing and we yeah. will see this generation generationally start working itself out mm. i think as shadi said you know society is changing and this is changing society you know it's a it's, it's so important yeah. Susanna, can I try to turn yeah. this into a, a positive so that we can end this <laughs> the happier note? <laughs> this is depressing me. So, uh, yeah, there, there's still uh, racism, homophobism, you know, in, in society, even though people have been trying to combat that also for, uh, you know, thousands of years and and so yeah we could say this this will always be but one thing that keeps me going is thinking what if we didn't do this work how would the web then look like or how would technology exactly. look like so Perfect. um yeah so i think you know we need to continue working on this and and uh you know technologies keep coming the challenges keep pouring in but we let's try to keep um you know uh, working at that yeah true so maybe, we have, we have maybe, many, maybe. many interesting questions and a lot of things going on in the in the chat, but we will need to wrap up and I, I promise you we will answer all the questions we can in writing after the um, after this session um, uh, today or next week uh, when we have the time. So we have got questions around the, the user testing insights and so on. There will be a, a lot of information about this in the in the project reports, of course, and in the website where we will provide all the results of the of the project. So um, uh, I'm really happy we had this discussion. It has been going all over the place and which is always nice. Uh, and, and I think that is the good thing with, with having good panelists that, that sort of move the, the topic from, from my initial ideas to, to something else. But I wanted to, uh, to let Sarah have the last, uh, the final words, if you have any concluding uh, things on, on this, I don't want to push you in any direction. You just well, I mean, just the floor. I would always, even though there's been a discussion around whether the criteria I presented is actually possible to do or not, I will still really promote to have a look at them um, when we when we publish it. And also to think that even, okay, we cannot solve everything, but we can make it better for some person somewhere, then that's already an advance. And I think that uh, everyone here today is really engaged in the topic and we tend to see perhaps that oh, it's not going fast enough and we forget all the advances that have been made that we are actually sitting here discussing the gaps and not the complete lack of information so this is really what i would like to say what makes me 
go on in same positive is really those small steps and um, being able to see when we talked with the pilots doing um, digital interfaces and with the users and the sort of revelation that the pilots actually had that these changes that they saw were so small in in design elements actually make a difference for somebody and to just see them realize that yeah i can actually do this it doesn't cost me so much um, all of these things makes it worth going on and working in this direction yeah, wow. If if anything that comes out of this that is an easy win for people, then wow, then then we have really succeeded. So that's really that's really a good way uh, to end this. So thank you, um, our fantastic panelists. I'm sorry I needed to make you stop talking sometimes, but that is my job as a moderator. I know that we will keep this discussion going for a long time. Thank you for everyone uh, discussing in the chat uh, and, and a lot of good ideas and, and discussions going on there. And special thanks to our interpreters, Robert, Tina and Julia have done a fantastic job with all these fast speaking people. Uh, thank you for keeping up with us and, and being so always perfect in your delivery. And uh, with this, I will just, well, thank you to Sarah, of course, for making this possible and to, for leading this project in a brilliant way, as always and also being the strategic leader of the research and innovation department at Funka. I didn't get, get your title right the first time, I think. So, and also Eva for all the technical help. And with that, it's two minutes past three. So we need to close this, but thanks everyone and have a fantastic weekend.